Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. It's Monday afternoon and we've been saying for a couple of weeks I've seen that we would be able to figure out whether or not we're going to be happy this Monday after the weekend's game. Are we happy? Um, I feel like it's, it's natural to, to feel a bit deflated after the, the way the game ended. But, um, you know, I've, I've said it before, I said it in the build-up to this game, that if we avoid defeat, if we come out of Ibrox without defeat, I'd be I'd be very content. I'd be very happy. You add into that the fact that I thought, you know, for, for 45 minutes we were we were brilliant um, you know, in that first half. Uh, look, a lot to discuss. Uh, but ultimately, you know, like I said, natural to feel a bit deflated. And I think a lot of fans will have done just because we were twice in winning positions, you know, from two and a half at half time and then to get three two up so late, you'd you'd ultimately want to come away with the three points. But when in the cold light of day, when we go back, analyse everything, that's a better result for us. You know, that's a better result for us. As much as they were celebrating and talking about moral victories and, and all all that nonsense, um, they went into yesterday really thinking they were going to win it. And and let's be honest, a, a victory for them would have put them in such a... That, that was the only outcome yesterday, a Rangers victory, which, which would have took it out of the other's hands. You know, then we were looking for snookers because we would have had to beat them and hope for drop points. They had a really good opportunity to do that yesterday at home with no fans for us, but with our captain not starting and not fully fit. All the, the talk about Clemence Rangers, they really thought they were going to win. Uh, and a lot of our fans went into it, think, you know, believing that we, we were in a bit of good form and we could do well. But for us to come away and play as well as we did, look, we'll discuss the concerns with the second half because I think that's a fair point as well in, in terms of the mentality of seeing a game out. But like I say, when we when we come away from it all, I'm I'm pretty content today. I think we're in a stronger position than we were before the weekend. Um, and if you ask me now, you look at the fixtures that are likely to come. Uh, I said it all along: if we avoid defeat at Ibrox, I think we'll win the league. Look, a lot of football still to go, but I'm I'm feeling pretty good about that today. Yeah, there is a lot to unpack. Absolutely, I see, and I think what you've said there about coming away from it and. Um, even though it was maybe the best part of 24 hours ago and sleeping on it and then, you know, ruminating about it this morning as I'm walking around Celtic Park. And then there is this sense of, you know what, the only unthinkable was a defeat, really, yeah. you know, for Celtic going in. And I think even with uh, the, the comments made by Brendan Rodgers in the run-up to the game in his press conference, you know, he was talking about that, keeping that whole calm persona that, I mean, I mean he was even talking about a loss not being a disaster. I disagree yeah. with that. I think a loss would have really, I mean, in terms of momentum. And listen, we'll talk about the power and momentum just within this game. I see. Never yeah. mind in the title race. But going into that, um, on on the Axon Bulletins leading into it, I had spoken about predictions and quite a few of the contributors were talking about a 2-1 victory. And I had said something along the lines of we need, we need to score three goals uh, because we'll, we'll only get two of them. Didn't quite exactly work that way, but <laughs> We will have to talk about um, the, the refereeing decisions. We'll need to talk about, as you say, the way we manage the game. That's the one. We need to take that on our chin, ask him and say, right, OK, let, let's argue the toss around the the, uh, the penalty decision. And we could probably argue about that all day. And there's going to be different, and I've seen this on the socials, different takes on it, right? But what about the second goal we concede? What about the third goal we concede? They're the two that really annoy me because I think that they're so avoidable. Yeah. So we, we can't look at the game in its entirety and just focus on what I felt was a poor refereeing decision yeah. in the end. Uh, we need to look at what we could do better. I want to start off with um, Maeda. I want to start off with Dyson Maeda. Now, over the last few weeks, uh, we've been talking a wee bit about cult heroes. It's a subject that I'm really fond of. I love the whole thought process behind what is a cult hero, what makes a cult hero. And the reason we're doing that is because we had Paddy, obviously. Paddy was over for a couple of gigs and it was fantastic on Thursday and yeah. Friday night. Um, and the, the conversation went down the road of who is our cult hero now? And I'm thinking it's Maeda, right? Because, I mean, just recently where he scores the hat-trick, he misses three guilt-edged opportunities. <laughs> uh, the whole thing about, you know, he's done so, so well in games against Rangers. And within 20, what was it, 21 seconds, he opens the scoring, I seem. I mean, I said a few weeks back, people disagree, and that's what it's all about. If he's fit, he starts for me. Because even though he had a couple of crosses that ended up in the broom one, right? We get it. What he showed, I mean, when you watch that back, what the, the ground he made up on Tavernier, 
need to actually get his ricochet in was, was frightening. And I think all day he gave us a bit of a you know assurance. I, I don't think as much as I've seen this season that our left side was the weak side defensively. We have seen that this season. Yeah. I don't think I saw that yesterday. No. Um, he's a very, like, you know, when you talk about cult heroes and everyone's got their own different criteria, but he, he really does fit the bill, doesn't he? Just from his lack of celebrations at some times, his, now he's what he's going through with his hair, um, his, his, you know, his erratic performances, but he is, he's he's 100%. He's probably one of the first names in the team sheet for this fixture. How, how well has he done in I, at Ibrox, uh, particularly? You know, he's he set the tone there yesterday and only he could have caused that kind of chaos at the back where Tavernier straight away is panicking. I've seen a lot of people say Tavernier had a poor game, but I think a lot of that was down to, to Maeda really pinning him back. And as you've said, we've seen problems in that left side um, of our of our team this season, but 100% yesterday I thought it was our stronger side, um, both from an attacking and defensive sense. Um, and yeah, it was just unreal. It was <laughs> surreal the the start to a game, I don't think I've ever seen it in like it. I remember a, a, a really early Chris Sutton goal um, back in Martin O'Neill's time, which was apparently quicker than that, um, which you find hard to believe because it was it was just such a a whirlwind start. But yeah, Maida, you know, he's 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 a first pick on the team sheet for these kind of games, definitely. For all his flaws, what he provides us in terms of um, pressing, because I think during that dominant spell where we were kind of all over them, he was the key to that press. Uh, so, yep, I think he's, he's going to be a key factor in the remainder of the season. Um, he's not had his best season, but I think he's, he's still contributing heavily. Um, and you've seen yesterday why he's such an important part of the team. Like you say, in the same token, there's bits where he's he's beat his man and he's crossing it over. And he did that the week prior at Livingston as well. So it's something that you wish he can really work on, because if he does that, you know, he's going to be even more effective. But um, yeah, it was such a, such a great start. It set the tone. Um, and yeah, it was, it was just you know we spoke about not using the word roller coaster, but it really was from minute one. Well, not even minute one, twenty seconds in, right to the ninety eighth minute. It was, it's honestly draining. I was exhausted by the end of it. Yeah, we mentioned the roller coaster and and calling players Rolls Royces. We'll we'll come up with different descriptives for all that kind of stuff. It was more of a I always say uh, going on the waltzers after being on the ghost train. That's what <laughs> yes. But you know, I was thinking about it last night, and obviously the usual. Um, kind of flack you get on the socials I've seen for having an opinion um, that doesn't completely align with that of uh, the opposite fan base. And they find it so difficult to understand that you might have a different view on things. Um, but obviously I'm dealing with a lot of that kind of stuff and I'm looking at it going, you know, by the end of the night thinking, you know, if you take a step outside of the bubble, right, if you look at that game and you remove, which we will talk about, you remove uh, the fact that there was missiles thrown at the Celtic dugout. We are going to discuss that. You remove the chanting, which is unacceptable um, in any arena, as a football game. And I don't mean as a spectacle, because to be quite honest, when it comes to broadcasting, um, I don't think you've got to uh, bend over as much as Scottish football has done for the broadcasters. But from anybody watching that game yesterday, it had everything, right? Yeah. So you had great goals, brilliant goals, you know, even the penalties. Strangely enough, there was two penalties in the game, and both of them were pretty sensational. You've got yeah. the Penenka. And then you've got the unstoppable one. Um, great goals. You've then got the comeback. You've then got what you thought as a winner. Then you've got the last minute equaliser and all the emotions and everything else that goes around that. Plus a couple of decisions that you could debate all day with regards to referees and VAR. So I think the game had just about everything yeah. I've seen. But it's very difficult to see that when you're in the midst of it. When you're really, you know, a Celtic fan, fully the emotion watching it. Because the emotions just run so so high at the time, don't they? Yeah, hundred percent. Like as much as people are like off for a neutral, but you're just you're so invested. You know, you're you're literally every kick of the ball, even at two 0 up, like at half time. As much as we were playing brilliant, you just knew that how quickly momentum can change. Um, so you know, then you've got the the up and down of when they got the the two each goal right after the penalty, and then for that to be turned, it was just a constant to and fro from from minute one to the end and yeah in terms of the the spectacle i thought it was it was a you know it was one of those that had everything i don't i think the quality from us in the first people have said oh you know it was exciting but maybe didn't have the quality i've heard a few people say that but i thought some of our football in the first half was brilliant equally the second half was was a concern in terms of the drop off but um overall yeah for for anyone watching that um as you've said scottish football often likes to score own goals and do everything it can to 
to lessen itself as a product. You know, I see someone in the comments say I wish they could get the nighttime games back, but how much would that add to it as well? You know, the if we, we started having nighttime derbies um, just to add to the occasion. So, but in, in terms of in terms of yesterday, yeah, it was it was brilliant for for those probably that are not invested as much as we are. Obviously, it's real. It really is hard to enjoy that when you're when there's so much riding on it, and it, it takes it out of you. Well, I had a wee bit of the gym or yesterday at two 0 I'm thinking to myself, I seem we need a third so that I can actually relax. because uh, yeah. even at two nothing, I'm not counting my chickens. We were really chuffed at half time. We'll come back to the fact that we went in two nothing up, not only due to the goals, but also due to, to Joe Hart. But Kevin and I were, were very buoyant. Um but there has been a, a trend this season of Celtic playing forty five minutes of football and then being unrecognizable in the yeah. the other half. Be that you, you know turning up for the first or the second half, we've seen it flipping either side. We've called it the Jekyll and Hyde effect. There was a wee bit of that. I mean, last night I was looking at the dynamic of the game, and I think there's two trains of thought here. Um, last night I I was firmly of the belief everything flipped on the VAR decision for the penalty, um, and I think overnight looking at the the way that we didn't really make much in the way of inroads in the second half, I see. Mm-hmm. The other train of thought would be that that we weren't at the races, and that's why that's why Rangers came in. Yeah, I, I still think it was a bad decision, but we played into the fact that the dynamic completely changed. We played into the fact that the, the momentum swung. Um, what side of that argument are you on? I, I think both are both are relevant. Um, there's no denying that at two 0 maybe if we held on another ten minutes or so, the the because look at two 0 down they were going to come at it at the start of the second half. That that was we were all going to expect that they were going to come right gung ho and go for it. But I didn't even see that even in the first few minutes of the, the second half they were still making slack passes. Um, Rangers that is and I think Rio had a, a shot on goal, so I still felt comfortable. And then the penalty decision naturally gives them a, a boost, which look, goals change games. The momentum completely shifted after that. We didn't then do enough to halt back the momentum. That that's that's a hundred percent. I think from then on in, we were a bit of a shambles in terms of we got chaotic. We let them overrun us. Um, but you know, I did expect them to come and come and have a go. So I think both points are relevant that we didn't help ourselves. But in saying that, you you give them a penalty decision like that, it boosts the crowd, it boosts everyone. And um, you know, I've seen a, I've seen a few takes on it, and the one that I agree with most in terms of pundits that I've, I've read was I don't know if you've seen Michael Stewart in sports scene, mm-hmm. but for me, it's never a penalty. And and the fact that the VAR when they showed beating the clip, they didn't show him, they didn't show Johnson getting the ball, and that's a key key factor in that decision because he got the ball and then the contacts made. Most of which was initiated by um, Silva leaning into to Johnson. So for me, the fact, firstly, Beaton got the decision right on the pitch, but for VAR then not to show him the full clip for me is baffling. Why? Why would they not show you the full clip? Because it's such a integral part in the decision making process that he got the ball first, and why some pundits and and people can't see that uh, is baffling me. So yeah, um, a game changing decision, but. Yeah, I'm not naive enough to think that Celtic didn't really respond to that. Having having Rangers got to two one, I felt that we should have done more to gain control of that game back. And and as you mentioned, it's something we've seen quite a lot this season, where first half we're totally in control, and then a bit of pressure, a bit of stress, and we don't seem to fully uh, wrestle that back in our favour. You know, when when you're talking about the the actual footage itself, uh, this this is the frustration, isn't it? Because if a referee is called over because they reckon in the VAR room that there's been a clear and obvious error and the ref goes over, I'm looking at that point and I'm thinking, I'm not too worried because if he watches this in its entirety, I seen my only concern is he's not going to be strong enough. He would stick to his decision because he got it right. Now, this, this argument has raged on and I know for a fact there will be Rangers fans in the comment section call them out if they're being um, disruptive or abusive or any of that kind of stuff. If it's they're funny, not, I don't actually see many of them today. I don't that, see that is unusual. <laughs> that is unusual. But listen, I'll, I'll debate about football all day long. It doesn't matter who you support, particularly on the socials. But the minute you start becoming abusive and all that, I see it's just like right goodbye. You know, I've, I've got no time for that kind of stuff. It's incredible how many males of a similar age to me are telling me how unattractive I am and I'm thinking well that's not my problem mate if you you know it's your problem that's your problem not mine and um, I don't know what the underlying reason for that is however with regards to the the VAR 
Um, what really brought it home to me, I see, in regards to the human element of it, was when we spoke to Peter Grant. Now, I know Peter Grant has got a completely different take on the penalty decision, but we yeah. spoke to him last year, and he was telling me about a guy that he knew that what's in the VAR room down south. And he was speaking about the fact that, you know, the technology can be skewed. And yeah. he was talking about it. It was a different example. But the example he gave is is, is the line and the, and the width of the lines. So if you've got a, a green line and a red line and you're offside, you can you can shorten the thickness of one of the lines to make sure you're onside. That kind of thing. Yeah. Which you're like, wait a minute, the minute a human becomes involved in this, then you've got issues. And I think we saw yeah. an example of that at the weekend. Here's my take on it, right? People are always going, oh, you don't know the rules, check IFAB. Listen, everybody can check IFAB. Even when 10 people read the rule, you're still going to get a different take Different interpretations. Absolutely. And this is the issue. Right, what's the first issue here? Silver dived. There, there you go. Right, there it is. That's the issue. And that's what Beaton called on the pitch. And when you see it from behind the ref, I seem, he's got a perfectly clear view of what's going on. Was he influenced by the fact that he had dived, I don't know, two or three times before yeah. that? Possibly. Possibly. That's the human element coming into it, right? But he died. So there is the first indiscretion. As he's going down, having dived, there is contact. Before the contact is made, Johnston wins the ball, as you say. So yes. for me, it's a dive. It's not a penalty. And I think Beaton got it spot on. You agree. Brendan Rodgers you've, you've seen, I don't know if you've seen the if you've seen the clips of you know you can see from behind the goals, even the Rangers fans who've got a quite good view of it mm-hmm. <laughs> because it's right in front of them. You can see them almost embarrassed and, and tell them to get up. None of them were looking like they were even claiming for it, and they've got just as good a view as is beating or anyone because they're right in front of it and they're actually yeah. facing the incident. So yeah. you know it says it says it all. Like you said, I've seen Peter Grant's take on it as well. Um surprised because as you've mentioned, there's two aspects to it which make that not a penalty. Initially, he's the one that's died firstly, which then initiates the contact. But before that, Johnson's got the ball. And then, like I said, I keep coming back to it. I just cannot, for the life of me, see why they've not shown that full clip. But look, for all we know, Beaton might have seen the full clip and still given the penalty because what tends to happen is when you're called over to the monitor, you're going to give the decision that they're persuading you to do. But at least show him the full clip. At least let him see the full incident rather than just a bit where the contact's made. So, uh, you know, people, again, I heard on the radio yesterday, um, there was a few callers on the Super Scoreboard uh, pr- criticising beating or the officials, and straight away they're, you know, they're shouting him down, saying, no, he's had a, he's had a good game, that shouldn't be the, the talking point, we've had a great spectacle, why are we talking about the officials? Fine, we've had a great spe- spectacle, <laughs> just because we've had a great spectacle doesn't mean that we can't still call out decisions, and that's not the only one, I'm sure we'll go over a couple of other ones, and I said this last week, and a few of the other guys on the on the podcast said the same. It might not even be match game changing decisions, which the penalty was, but it's other wee things as well. You know, in terms of yellow cards stopping up, not giving yellow cards when players are going into the, the crowd, and not stopping the game when it's a clear head knock. All these things which add up, and you're just like, that's not right. That's that's either incompetence or, as we've said before, pattern of assistance, whatever you want to call it. But it wasn't. It wasn't a good officiating performance. No, you, you are right, and um, you, you brought up the the Yang head knock. Chris Sutton on the on the commentary team was raging about that because obviously he is he's one yeah. of these guys that speaks out constantly about um, footballers, next footballers, and protecting the fact that uh, you know so many ex players I seem are affected by um, head knocks, and you know that there's a big push in the down south anyway, and hopefully the SFA getting on it as well. Um, with ex-players who are now suffering dementia and um, trying to link that to it being a workplace accident, you know, that's actually caused yeah. it uh, over that period of time as well. We will be talking about the missiles. I do want to get people's views on this. Listen, it's all about views. Um, it's not what you say is right, what I say is wrong and all that. We can we can both yeah. um, have a debate. And, and social media sometimes is a difficult place to have that debate. I seem as I'm sure everybody who uses it has found uh, to their detriment and it can, it can become very time-consuming. But when, um, this morning, I took my wander around paradise, uh, just for everybody who tunes in on a Monday night at 6 o'clock, I was joined by Tino Callaghan from the Celtic Exchange. Um, Tino, in the past, has contributed to the Axom Charity Weekender, and he has recently 
started a series of interviews that are on his channel on YouTube, going back to the big takeover back in 94, 30 years ago. Uh, the Battle to Save Celtic, go and check it out. It's a quite spectacular uh, collection of interviews. I think there's half a dozen on there at the moment. There's a few more in the what in the works. Um, it's superb. It's absolutely brilliant. Go and check it out. And Tino and I speak about that tonight as well. Now, Ridiculizer, you're coming in to say John Beaton went rogue and followed sporting principles. He didn't want to give that penalty. Uh, was arguing against it, telling people to shut up, etc. He went off script. I have to give him his due. You sometimes wonder, I seem, after the event and when the referee is taken out of the heat of the battle, what he thinks about certain decisions. I do wonder because, mm. you know, I just think that sometimes, and I, I've not given John Beaton credit for much, sometimes you've got to say, right, believe in yourself. you got it right. You've got it right. And I wonder if he goes back to that and looks at the different reactions and looks at different angles and thinks, actually, I did get it right. I never saw that on the VAR. I was shown a part of a, of a, of a video which kind of paints it in a different light. It must be frustrating for the referee. The other thing I've not checked yet, actually, I see, and I wanted to check it. Not only the reaction of the fans, what was the reaction of the Rangers players? Were they claiming for it? I know it doesn't make make it a penalty either way. Were they claiming for it? I'm not sure. Because when I was watching the unique angle this morning, they clearly didn't show any of the Rangers action. It was all the Celtic stuff. Yeah, you know, but that. um so Dyes and Maida, regardless of the colour he is here, he's Dyes and Maida, he's our cult hero. And then you move on, uh, not only about a goal ahead, uh, we get a penalty kick, which, again, I think yesterday I said that it's one of these unique moments in Scottish football that Goldson can handle <laughs> a ball and be penalised for it. But let's have a wee chat about Matt O'Reilly, right? I mean, yeah. Matt O'Reilly has been getting a bit of stick as of late. He's mm -hmm. spoken about the fact that, you know, in January I seem a lot of interest, and I'm not just by Atletico Madrid, and it might have taken his focus off the game a wee bit. People say the head's turned. Well, let's let's have a think about this for a minute. He's a young guy, right, who's on the up and up. He's a young guy who not that long ago was on the bit of the, you know, a bit of a, a, a scrap heap having left Fulham, right, because yeah. he had this belief that he could, he could find a club. Uh, COVID happened and he's out the game for six months trying to keep himself fit. I mean, the worry and the concern and everything, a real turning point in his football career, um, then happened when he signed for MK Dons, and he's been on the up and up ever since. He signs for Celtic. He then gets in the team, and he's a regular. Then he, you know, steps up, plays in the Champions League. He gets his under twenty one debut. He gets his full international debut. It just seems that every single obstacle he comes up against, he's yeah. able to overcome it. But I do think he's maybe been waylaid a wee bit. I don't see that as him having his head turned. It's just that you know that intense interest in his services in January, and he's spoken about it. Might have knocked him off track a wee bit. But see, when I watched that game yesterday mm. and him stepping up and doing what he did, it was remarkable. How, how on earth can you keep your nerve in a situation like that? Yeah, uh, and I agree with you. I don't think it's a, a head turn situation with Matt because he, anytime you hear him or anyone that's, that knows him um, and how he comes across, he seems a very level headed individual, very focused on the here and now, you know, takes everything as right, very laid back, calm kind of character. So I don't think he's one of those. I think this may be. He was so good for that first part of the season, um, almost single-handedly at times. So naturally, that you know takes its toll, and he, he had a kind of poor spell. But I don't think it's been through a, a lack of effort or you know being distracted. I think he just had a, a bit of off form. But yesterday, I thought he was brilliant, especially that first half. I think him and Rio Tati for me were the pick of the bunch. You know, just some of the passing, the little intricate moves, link up play. Um, you know, he, he could have had a good couple of assists. Yesterday as well, on top of his goal, Matt O'Reilly had Maida put his away. Rio had one. I think Kyogo was put through as well once. So I thought he was brilliant. And then, like you said, I don't know why he's not taking penalties before. He's the only one, it seems, that hasn't hasn't actually taken one. And when, when he stepped up yesterday, I was quite calm and confident, which is rare for a Celtic penalty, given how many we missed. But I was like, he's the obvious choice. And calm, coolness personified, absolutely brilliant um, in the heat of the moment. And I thought he was, you know, a real, there was chat this week about obviously we had five midfield options and some people even suggested maybe he was the one to drop out if McGregor came back in because they wanted to see Hatati, Iwata and, and maybe uh, McGregor. But for me, Matt O'Reilly, he's a, another one who's one of the, the first names on the team sheet. Um, and I think, again, he'll, he'll play a, a kind of crucial 
role. Um, like like everyone, we kind of naturally dropped off in the second half, and and himself included. But I think just in that first half, we've seen the quality he's got, um, and you've seen how good our football team we are when we're when we're on it, and you've seen how much better than them we are. Because as much as they came into it in the second half, it wasn't through good football or or really opening us up. It just they, they kind of pressed us a bit higher, and then our own slackness invited them back into the game, aided with some of the decisions. But you know we're a better football team, and when we've got that midfield three firing when when McGregor's back fit, that's you know that's a dangerous trio. Um, again, I thought Rio was brilliant, so you know I, I'm pretty confident going into the final tail end of the season here. Right. Well, well, this is the thing that you know. I go back to something that Brennan Rogers said, and it's on the tagline today: writing your own story. And um, I think Brennan's pretty good at, at, at kind of controlling the narrative. Um, I thought he was brilliant in the lead up to this game, at keeping everything quite calm. You know, even when he was, you know, they were looking for a headline and, and a wee bit of a soundbite when it came to the refereeing. And they're thinking, right, we're going to throw John Beaton's name into this. I see him, and Brendan Rogers is the guy that's named him, and yeah. had to be up at the beaks. It was like, I see. You know, one of the best referees we've got, and he completely <laughs> turned the narrative on its head. And I think he's good at that. And he was talking about writing your own story. We're writing our own story. We still are. And I think that's what's important after that game. Yes, it's disappointing to be a two goals up. Then another uh, occasion where you're thinking we've won this. Six minutes to go, we can do this, and uh, not win the game. That's disappointing. But we've came away with a draw, um, and it is in our hands. We are the architects of our own future here, you know what I mean, it's like if we win the six games, we win the league um, there might be a few hiccups along the way, who knows it would not surprise me if there were, the thing on Matt O'Reilly when he steps up to take that as I say, I sometimes try and put my myself in the headspace of these footballers because, you know it's modern football, I see, when people constantly say, oh, you know, pampered players and the money and, and the riches and all the rest of it, these people are 24 our a day athletes, and that's yeah. that's not just physical. I mean, you look at the what you what it takes mentally to be so tuned in to take a penalty, a normal penalty, not a penenka, just to take a penalty in a circumstance like that. Um, it, it would almost be like an outer body experience. I've spoken to players who've taken penalties in these games, and I, I try and get into their state of mind. I see them like, how on earth can you handle that? I'm biting my nails watching it. How can you handle that? And I remember, one of the ones I, I do remember vividly, standing in the broom loan, and um try to remember who I was with that day. Nez Henderson, there you go. Big shout out to Nez up in Logelli, uh, the Arthur McKenna. I was with Nez that day. And I seen Wes Thompson and, and Paul McPherson, about three or four rows in front of me, in, in the broom loan. And it was in nothing each game, and we get a penalty. Right? Now this is in the same season, of the Samaras game where he scored the two goals at the new year. We get a penalty and Samaras and Commons, they're no arguing, but they are debating as to who's taking this penalty, I see. And just, just a few, I was so nervous about it. I kind of thought to myself, give it to Commons, even though I love Big Sammy, give it to Commons. And mm. Samaras, of course, the penalty was saved. And you think to yourself, the, the, the pressure that's on you. So to be able to do that, we think when he's been getting a bit of stick, I just thought, wow. And it actually bodes well for me for the rest of the season with Matt O'Reilly. I think that if he has had a sticky patch, I think that weekend game and everything that went with it will, will play massively into his hands. What I would say also, Pally Mine said to me, right, we're, we're all dying to get McGregor back for the game. But don't forget, Hattati's got one game under his belt. He's not 100% yeah. match sharp. Cal McGregor won't be 100% match sharp. Somebody in that midfield's going to have to do all their running. Not all their running, but, you know, make up for that. And I think O'Reilly did. And I think after about 70 minutes, it showed as well. I see him. He looked a bit leggy by that stage of the game. Yeah, um, I, I think that, like, initially, I was when I seen McGregor wasn't starting, I was quite, you know, disappointed, thinking, oh, that's going to be a big loss. But in hindsight, you see, obviously, that McGregor wasn't, wasn't fully at it and... Again, in hindsight, you probably think, was it the right decision to bring him on? But even when, when the subs were made, I know people are probably criticising the subs, but I thought they were the right subs at the time. I thought Yang for Kuhn um, and McGregor to come on and, and solidify things was the right call. And I think most fans would have agreed. It's, it's easier to say afterwards, but yeah, McGregor just looked way off it. As you said, we kind of became leggy. 
Um, Rio, who was having a good game, obviously second game back, so naturally you, you probably expected him to come off. But Bernardo did well when he came on. Uh, Iwata, I've, I've said about, I thought he was okay, but I don't know. I've, I've still yet to be fully convinced by Iwata in terms of what he's what he's offering. Um, I don't think he had a bad game, but I don't know if he, he contributed brilliantly either. Um, and you know, we'll we'll go on to probably talk about the weaknesses for for their second and third goal in terms of. Yang's kind of contributions, but in terms of the subs, I've seen a few people say Brendan made the wrong call with the subs, but at the time, I personally thought they were the right subs. I don't know about yourself, but I thought that was the one. I thought Kuhn, you know, he he didn't do it. I'll cut him some slack. It was his first time in a fixture like that, but I thought, you know, he, he didn't do as much as I thought he could have. Um, still put in a good couple of crosses. It was his cross that got the ultimately led to the penalty. Um but I was like, I was looking forward to seeing Yang come on and, and having a go at their fullback, but it just didn't kind of material, uh, materialize for him. But in terms of, um, yeah, when when we've got that midfield trio, like you said there, when McGregor's fully up to speed, Hatati's fully up to speed, and O'Reilly, and then you've got Iwata and Bernardo, who I thought again came on and did really well. He really seems to thrive in this fixture. Um, you know, we've we've got a good solid few options in there. You know. I, I, it's good that you brought up the substitutions because Ben and Rogers has been criticised throughout the season for that, I've seen. But I tend to agree with yourself on this. And I'm not just saying that um, because I do think that at the time, you know, when Hattati comes off, he's knackered. And you think, yeah. well, at that point, 63, 64 minutes into the game, if you bring on Bernardo at that stage, I think Rogers is getting criticised because people are saying, bring on the captain, show it up. The, the mistake that McGregor made was uncharacteristic of him. Yes. You know, he doesn't do that often in a season, right? So it's easy after the game to say, right, we shouldn't have brought McGregor on, he wouldn't have lost it, but et cetera, et cetera. That's fine. But at the time, I thought it was the right move. Kuhn, um, off, Yang on. I think initially I thought he was he was booked and that might have affected him because yeah, he, he got, he got right. that booking. And and I did feel that, you know, we spoke about it. It was it was raised by Kevin McCluskey. Um, if you get kind of like an early, early booking, it can really affect the rest of your game in a match like this, because you're going to have to be full-blooded in, in a number of occasions. Um, you can't be holding back. Kuhn was Not a disappointment that, for me. Down that side as well, Paul John, you had Johnson on a yellow and Kuhn on a yeah. yellow, so, and they had Matondo on at that point, and they, you know, I, I can't remember, but a lot of their attacks were coming down that side, so for me, again, it seemed like the wise decision, because if you've got two of them and they're doubling up or someone makes a vast challenge, the last thing you want is to give the officials a chance to send someone off. Uh, so yeah, you're right. I forgot about the yellow, which, which again, for me, that's why I was like, okay, that's a good sub to make. Totally, absolutely. And you think the other option that we had, uh, other than bringing on Yang at that time, would have been James Forrest. So if you imagine the alternative and bringing on Bernardo and Forrest, I'm pretty sure the fans would have been going at a meltdown sixty odd minutes in the game. However, it's it's okay to talk about it now. My flip on that, if people are criticising the, the substitutions, uh, is the third goal. You know, mm-hmm. the architect of that goal is Bernardo and the scorer of the goal is either. Both of them came on. So I think that you've got to give Brendan credit for that. So that the third goal was scored by, and, and created by two players that he had brought on. And at that point, I'm looking at Ida and I'm thinking to myself, you've made it, son. You've absolutely made it into the folklore of Celtic Football Club. You know, you're that guy and that's going to make a massive difference to what happens here on in. I actually felt a bit gutted from me when he scored that goal. He took it so well as well. well and you're thinking a, you're a hero. Oh, it was a brilliant goal. Um, what's your take on Ida? Because, yes, he missed the, the penalty at Tynecastle, but he went on that wee score and run and had a few assists. He's now scored against Rangers. And I think that, you know, at 23, there's got to be a discussion at the end of the season. I don't know what kind of price that Norwich yeah. would be looking for, but he's far more effective. You don't get what he's given. Um, us, you don't get that from O, for example. Yeah. He's totally out of the picture, by the way. I don't know if he's injured, but he's, he's yeah. not been in the last couple of squads. But you're right. Um, Ida, for me, I like him. I think it will come down to price, but I, I do like him anytime I've seen him. I know he's, uh, like you say, he missed the penalty, but he's, he's won us four points, both at uh, Fur Park and Easter Road. Yesterday, now, I, I, my, my kind of take at the end of the game when I was trying to reflect was. As much as we were deflated, uh, obviously, the way the, the order of the goals went, but see it to each with maybe, what, 10 minutes still to go, plus, your, your, well, it was three minutes to go of normal time. 
uh, when Sima scored, I think, or I can't remember when Sima scored, but Sima scored quite late. And then we scored. Uh, before we scored, sorry, I was quite panicking at that point that we could want to lose. So even just us getting hit 3 2, you know, could be a crucial change in, in, in the fact that because that, I said it before, yesterday was a must not lose. Um, and that's that's the key take home away for me. So, you know, gutted for Ida because you're right. That's if that if we if that's the winning goal, that's a goal that we're going to talk about for years to come. Almost like that uh, Odson Edward one, you know, um, mm. when it was a three two game as well, and you've seen the celebrations at the side, and that's the one criticism we should have done better to see that game out. You know, we should have. You could argue could we have made a sub at that point. You know, to down the right hand side or something. Maybe people have mentioned bringing on another defender, but. You can't you can't legislate for what was really really poor play from Yang for for Matondo's goal, um you know that that was not wasn't like a cross ball that we lost from it was just really really poor in terms so of how easy yeah in terms of how easy he let him in but yeah just to touch on Ida sorry uh, I I'm, I'm I'm quite a fan of him I think he holds the ball up well he links up well um he, he's got a goal in him he he really enjoy you can tell he's really enjoying his football with us. Uh, offer something completely different to Kyogo, and I think they they work well together in terms of like even when they play together, but also just in terms of what Kyogo offers for maybe the first 60 70 minutes, and then he comes on and does something completely different, similar to the kind of dynamic we had when Jack Marcus was here. You know, yeah. there's that kind of element to it. So, I think he, he's someone to watch out for if it's a, a reasonable price, and I don't know what that would be, but I think if we're talking maybe under six million, like you say, his age. Is a good age as well, where where Brendan can work with him if he's still here, um, and <laughs> is someone we can we can mold into an even better player. So yeah, I think him him and Bernardo both yesterday again. It's it's been one of those they both keep making you think, right? There's something there to to maybe make these both players permanent. The the thing we are is we're fans and we want to finish that the call yesterday. We don't want it in a six months or or in twelve months. And I think Brendan Rodgers is looking at both of those guys. Um, I'm on the fence with a pair of them in terms of the, you know, if, if both of them were a six million pound signing. Um, you think back to the CCV and Jota pre-season where we signed those two guys, and you think, okay, they're no at that kind of stage, but we're a couple of years down the line now. The difference I think between Ida and Yakamakis is the age profile. You know, he's got five years on Yakamakis, I think, at the same kind of um, at the same same time of their career. And if you were to to bring them in for that kind of fee. I mean, in terms of six million pound, you know, Danielle on the comments has said this before: the Celtic board are making us believe that that's a big fee. Yeah. When, when in actual fact, what does it get you? Really, what does it get you? you? You know, we should be looking at things like we don't we don't need to sell before we buy anyway. But let's mix up, maximize the the fee that we're going to get for Mikey Johnston. The guy's on fire, and they maximize the fee because there's money in that championship. What would they normally play uh, pay for a winger who scores yeah. the, the amount of goals and creates the amount of assists? Well. That's the ballpark that we should be looking at, and then basically, you know, that that's the the lion's share of a, of a six. If you can get three or four million quid for Mikey Johnson, brilliant. Because I didn't think we we're getting anything from yeah. for him over over the last few seasons. I think there's now, a couple of reasons why we like the, the figures become such a big thing in, in fans' heads because a we spend so infrequently that kind of money. So you know when we when we have done, it's been you know like you say Jota and CCV in recent times, Edward and. Um, Julian before that, but then you're looking way back to Martin O'Neill's days, and you look at the yeah. kind of players we brought in. But football's changed, like you said, six million nowadays isn't going to get you the kind of players that we got for six million back in the early two thousands. Um, and added to the fact that because our transfer kitty just seems to be so sporadic in terms of how we spend it, it's all you know 10, 10 players at two million. We almost worry that okay, if we're spending six on Bernardo or six on. Um, Ida, that's it. We're not going to spend any more. Just because, again, because the board have kind of manipulated us into thinking, oh, this is a big, big spend. That's, that's you know, we've, we've gone all out on these two guys. That's your lot. So I think that's why as fans, we kind of panic at the thought of a £6 million signing when essentially, given the figures we've got in the bank, given the, the, cha- the, the two seasons consecutive of Champions League we've had and the potential of a third, that should just be, you know, your run-of-the-mill signings. And then you maybe get another bigger one, and then you, you complement that with maybe a couple of the project development type players. But it should be that balance. Mm-hmm. But because we've been so starved of that for so long, the thought of a six million pound Anida who's not starting every game right now suddenly puts us into panic. And that's the kind of way we should be looking at our signings: guys that are going to make you better, then guys that are going to come straight in. 
and it should be a balance like that. No, you're right. You're right. And again, and I've said this so often on this show and before, I see him as uh, if we're spending 20 million quid, buy three players. Buy three yeah. players. And, you know, eventually when you look at the formula, one of them will make you big money down the line anyway, at least. Um, you know, we've had a couple of flops, but not many in that price range. I want to talk about uh, Yang. I want to talk about McGregor. These are the two big things that I think I'm so disappointed with because if we do a couple of simple things there, we prevent both of those goals. Now, McGregor, yeah, it's easy with hindsight. Say, oh, we shouldn't have brought him on. I wanted him on. You wanted him on. That's not like him. That's not like mm -hmm. I'm fit or unfit, you know, a slack pass like that. I'm far more disappointed with Yang. And it's not a case of just trying to have a dig at the guy. I, I've I've been impressed with him prior yep. to sending off against Hearts. And I'm looking at that and just thinking, you're not committed enough there, pal. You're just, you know, you need to be a... You can't just be good on the ball when exactly. you're a winger at Celtic. And it took Ethan Jota a while. I, I don't know if it was as long as six months to understand that. I remember a game against St Mirren away where he scored a really scrappy goal, I see him, and he was having a nightmare that day. It was rotten. And it was yeah. all about, right, he's a silky player. He's all about flair and taking guys on and, and creating chances. This isn't working for him, so he just needs to work. He just needs to be a workhorse, win the ball. But And it kind of, the penny dropped that day for me because it looked as though he had it in his locker, whereas previously he looked like the flair player who maybe doesn't want to do the dirty work. Yang's not there yet for me. And, I, yeah. you know, that, that was disappointing at the weekend. There's an angle from actually behind Matondo, and it's so obvious that Yang just kind of draws out the tackle. Yeah. And not even that makes no effort to get back in. Just get your body between him and the next defender, which I think was Liam Scales. Just get your body in there and close the, the angle. So, so disappointing. Is that the type of thing, do you think, looking at Yang, that can be improved? Because I, I think Palmer's guilty of it as well. He's yeah. another one that's off the radar at the moment, but I think he's guilty of it too. It has to be improved because if it doesn't, then you can't be a, a regular fixture in the Celtic team because the more you watch that, the more you're not infuriated because, well, yeah, to be honest, because it was, it was very half-hearted. It was, it was not just the fact that the initial drop of the shoulder, which everyone knew Matondo was going to do. You know, he's, he's always looking to come in. He scored an identical goal last, last week. It's the reaction after that. Very much just like, uh, you know, this isn't, you know, we're not 3 0 up at home to Ross County, where even then you wouldn't want to see that from your players. But to do that when we're 3 2 up, we've just got back in front, we've, we've had the backs to the wall in the whole second half, you know, the, the teams fought to get back in, back ahead, and you're at such a crucial stage in the, the game and the season, it's not acceptable, to be honest. And I, and I hope he's held his hands up or, you know, he's been pulled up for that and shown that clip several times that that doesn't happen again. Because, you know, as a as a wide player, yeah, your 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 main task is to be good on the ball and silky, and he's shown that in clips. But that reminded me of a game back at I think it might have been, I don't know if it was Rugby Park or, or St Johnston. I can't remember which one of the away games where he had an absolute shocker, and it almost looked like you know he just wasn't doing the basics right. That's basic, that's basic work rate, basic effort. Mm -hmm. Just you know, you know not to show a guy on the inside who's wanting to cut in and shoot on the right. But like I said, it's fine getting beat off a guy, which he didn't even need to do much. He literally just stepped inside. But then to not even try and make a, a, an effort to close it down further, just kind of hold your hands up. Uh, to me, that was unacceptable. And, and even for the second goal, I thought he was at fault. Now, look, we've all praised Yang, so we're not going to just suddenly turn on him or anything, not at all. But it's about learning and it's about getting better. And that's what makes you either succeed as a Celtic player or, or crumble. So if he comes on, if he has a stormer against St Mirren, brilliant. And if he makes sure that kind of thing doesn't happen again, then, you know, he's, he's still young, he's still learning, so I'm not going to absolutely cane him. But in isolation, those two two goals, obviously McGregor was largely at fault for the second one, but even then, Yang seemed like he was on his toes for that. Um, but the third one was was pretty much solely on, on Yang there. Um, I think it was in, in the lead-up, maybe the ball kind of got caught under Johnson's feet. I don't know if you've watched it back, but, yeah, it was just unfortunate. I don't know if it was the wind or whatever. We could have maybe cleared it even before it got to Matondo, but yeah, you're you know that's the biggest frustration. With yesterday, it was avoidable. It, was, it wasn't like it was you know attack after attack and we're hanging on. You know they they weren't really creating an awful lot, um, and, it, and it was a great goal, but avoidable. Absolutely avoidable. I, I remember a game against uh, Motherwell at Fur Park where Yang was was really poor in the yes, first half and he was hooked. 
Um, yeah. I think there's a bit of game intelligence that can be improved, but also you just need to have that desire, don't you? Um, and I think that's been the biggest issue with Palmer, who wasn't playing yesterday. Um, but I do have slight concerns, like you already raised, about Iwata. Iwata's been a, a player that, when he wasn't in the team, I wanted to see him getting a run. He's had a run, and we're able to then look at his performance and say, right, what do you think needs to improve here? Because he's obviously that wee bit older. Um MVP in Japan before we signed him. So, you know, that was an award that Maeda and Kyogo and Hatati never ever won, but he won it. And I'm looking at his game now, and I think he's great at that side of the game where he breaks things down. I think he's brilliant at that. You know, he's he's got really good positional sense. He, he seems to just block lanes and 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 you know break down attacks. I don't know if his ball retention's good enough for the Celtic team, though. I see him. And I, I think last week there was a few occasions. I think against Harps, he was guilty of losing yeah. the ball. He was guilty of losing the ball too much for me yesterday. And, you know, that's the thing where, again, we're talking about momentum shifts within a game. Possession is key, Mm. absolutely key. And he gave it away cheaply quite a few times yesterday. That's a bit of concern for me. Um, And I'm I'm, I'm not writing him off either, but I just think that the sooner McGregor's back and fit and firing, all the better. Now, I'm aware that I've not brought many of your comments up. Sorry about that. Me and Asim are having a wee chin wag about the game. Of course, Magnet 67, game changed on the shocking VAR penalty for them and our substitutions. The changes took the energy out of our midfield and Cal was way off. He was way off it. He absolutely was way off it. And I think that was the risk uh, that we took just by having him on the bench. But again, I've got to go back to what I was saying before the game and on Friday, Asim, to have Callum in that squad, to have him mm. in the hotel, on the coach, in the dressing room, the whole thing, at the, the pre-match meal, everything, I think that's key, just to have that influence. So, I, although I do agree with Magnet, he was way off it, it was, I thought it was very, very important to have him involved. And, OK, he didn't do great on the park, but, listen, I just think that your leader, your captain, yeah. isn't always the guy on the park. It can be the guy sitting in the dugout. Yeah, see, um, like you said, just his presence and being there, he makes such a difference. You can just tell how much of a, a leader he is with this group of players. And look, if we hadn't brought him on and Rangers went on to equalise or, or worse, we'd have all probably said, why didn't we bring Callum on? He would have been the exact type of player totally. to bring on. So, you know, it, it's all very well in hindsight. Um, again, I'll, I'll stick by it. I think it seemed like the right decision at the time. Obviously, the management and coaching staff thought the same. And yeah, you'd have been hard pushed to find many fans at that point that, that thought otherwise. In terms of Iwata, yeah, I've seen one of the comments there and he's like, he's like the new Lennon. But I think football's evolved, whereas that kind of style of player back then, or even just, you know, someone that just kind of keeps it, like you said, he's almost, he's losing possession, which when his main attribute is probably to be a safe kind of ball player who just keeps it moving without trying anything too tricky. But he's getting caught on the ball at times. Um, you know, I think he's got some attributes. He, like you said, he's, his work rate sometimes off the ball, his interceptions. But in a team that's predominantly got the ball, we're a possession-based team. I don't know if he's he's overly effective. Um, and then we've tried him now at a couple of away grounds where you know that you're going to have less of the ball, maybe time Castle Rangers to see if you know that he could be the perfect player for those kind of games. And I've yet to see him have a kind of standout performance. I think he's he's a decent squad player. Um, who who you can bring on when you're maybe ahead and you're you're wanting to close out a game, but starting games I've yet to see it from him um, in a consi- you know in a consistent manner. Um, but you know again, there's this time for him to kind of change change people's opinions on that. Uh, but yeah, overall um, with the the McGregor situation, you know he's gonna he's gonna get fitter, he's gonna get sharper, um, and by the time the next derby comes around, you know you can bet your bottom dollar you'll probably be the best player in the park again. What I like about Callum McGregor is I don't think there's the, the, the natural kind of needle um, of a Scott Brown, for example, right? But we have seen a wee bit of that with McGregor. We've seen a wee bit of that when he was wearing his mask in the 3 nothing game and he had a go at Barisic. Uh, we've seen a wee bit of it in one of the games that Clancy was refereeing and, and he was bamming them up, um, I seen. And I think that yesterday there was a wee bit of that with Cantwell. And, you know, there's something tells me that McGregor has got a wee black book somewhere, uh, figuratively speaking, and uh, he might get his own back on on Cantwell down the, down the line. Um, I always remember a wee story Andy Lynch said when we were doing his book about the fact that Johnny Doyle was a phenomenal player for Air United. He was one of the guys that wore his heart on his sleeve. He made he, he made absolutely you know 
no doubt in anybody's mind um, that he was a Celtic fan. Everybody knew he was a mad Celtic fan. And when Celtic signed him, he was the record signing, actually, Johnny. But I think it was 90,000 quid. Um, no secret to the fact that he was a, a Celtic supporter. Um, but him and Andy, really, on the pitch, had loads and loads of coming together and falling outs and all this and all that. And the rumour that was going around in the Celtic dressing room that when they signed Johnny Doyle was that he, he, he actually had a wee black book of all the players he was going to get back. So if somebody had uh, said something or done something or kicked them, yeah. he had a black, he wrote it down. He was going to get them back. <laughs> and and uh, they, they were laughing about this when they signed them. So they're waiting in the dressing room to welcome Johnny into the into the uh, dressing room. And Andy Lynch is sitting there. And they had obviously come to blows and had quite a few conversations, arguments on the part. And he walks into the dressing room with a Celtic scarf on. Like, he's just signed for the club. And uh, he was going around shaking the hands everywhere comes to Andy. And Andy's like, am I in your wee black book? Am I still in your <laughs> wee black book? And Johnny went into his pocket. Right, and opened it up. I don't know if he was in it, and he, he made out as if he was rubbing Andy's name at the book. <laughs> You're not in it anymore, Andy. You're not in it anymore, right? So hopefully Cantwell is in Cantwell. Callum McGregor's wee black book. I, I don't know if you've seen his Instagram post, but it's just oh my embarrassing, God. absolutely it embarrassing. embarrassing. <clears throat> it's absolutely shocking, right? A couple of other things I want to talk about before we go today. I want to talk about the the part played by Joe Hart. Um, the false equivalence for getting about a Watters foul that led to a Rangers goal that was chopped off after VAR. And I want to start off with the missiles, right? So over the piece, um, you know, the reason that there are no Celtic fans here, let's not forget the reason that Celtic are refusing to take tickets is the, the reason given was, was twofold, fan experience and fan safety. So when we were getting the 750, it was a fan safety issue. There was missiles getting thrown at the fans, etc. Players are unsafe. Um, I think the example that I would use with, with players being unsafe is uh, the glass bottle in the goal mouth. Again, that comes back to Joe right. Hart, where he was refusing to play. You, you think about pundits being unsafe. There are pundits who cannot go to Ibrox because their safety is at risk. I think it was uh, Chris Sutton and Neil Lennon in the past. Coaches unsafe. Um, th there have been coaches that missiles have been thrown at. Uh, and John Kennedy is the latest example of that at the weekend. Staff on safe physiotherapist has had a bottle smashed against his head that was thrown from the main stand. The fans, of course, are unsafe. That's why we're not there. And the refs are unsafe because they have been threatened um, because of the decisions they've made in these games. Celtic have released a statement. I seem, um, you know, all we're getting from the other side is that as long as that particular board is at Rangers, we're never going to get the full broom one back. Mm. Listen. I think what you need to do rather than play to the gallery is to ensure that you keep your own house in order. I mean, this is beyond a joke. You could bring yeah. in examples like batteries getting thrown at Griffiths or a fan. Brown. You know, Remember Brown getting attacked? Attacking Brown. Aye. So all of these things, there's there's a litany of, of examples here. But I just feel like it's just another one that you add to the list. I don't feel you like you add to that. You've done. got, even when they come to Celtic Park, you've got their, their players spitting at our fans. You yeah. know, I know it's a separate issue. But that just got brushed under the carpet. Totally. And I'm sure this will just get brushed under the carpet. So, as you said, it's not just limited now to, to the fan safety, which is a clear issue, which, as you did address with the 750 fans, you know, getting pelted by missiles. Um, you've now you've had the incident with Joe Hart, as you've mentioned. So, like you, like you basically just said, you've got players, co coaches, staff, fans. Nobody's safe when you go there. Pundits. If you can't guarantee safety of, of opposing fans and staff, players, coaches, whatever, then you shouldn't be there shouldn't be fans at the stadium when the game's been played or something should be done rather than it just constantly get brushed under the carpet. More needs to be said about this, more needs to be highlighted. Um it's all very well talking about oh it was a great spectacle for Scottish football. Yeah, it was an exciting game. But talk about that as well. You know, that this it's a duty on the broadcasters and the media to to highlight these incidents as well. Because again, it'll just be the, the same old narrative or old firm, uh, you know, chaos or whatever. That's the way it'll be portrayed as it's just a, a problem. But no, it needs to be called out. This is consistently happening at Ibrox. This is consistently happening to our players, our fans and our coaching staff. So it needs to be addressed. It needs to be spoke about. And it can't just constantly be like, oh, it's under investigation. And then we don't hear anything further about it. You know, I think you've probably still not held, held back about the the Balogun incident. Um but yeah, it's, it's beyond a joke now because it's it happens every time, and it's every time that they can't take it when things aren't going their way. To be honest, no, it's not just that they, they can't celebrate with you know with, in a orderly fashion. 
and when they're getting beat or they can't handle it, you know, it gets even worse. So something needs done. And again, I hope when people are talking about it in the phone lines and stuff tonight, it doesn't just get brushed under the carpet where they're just like, oh, let's talk about the football. I talk about everything. Yeah, you're you're 100% right. And I think sometimes we're guilty of it as a football club that we don't just, um, you know, run with it. We've got to grab these situations with the scruff of the neck and actually do something about it and make sure that they're being highlighted. Um, as in, because as you say, when it came to the spitting incident with um, uh, Balogun at the, the last game there, you know, waiting for an update, I'll come back to you on Monday. How many Mondays ago was that? That was months ago. And and there is no update. And there will be no update because there isn't an appetite for some strange reason to uh, pick up on this. Joe Hart obviously was at the heart, was at the heart of one of these incidents with the, the broken glass in his goal mouth. I think he was outstanding yesterday. There's a lot of people now actually saying that he's been our player of the year. Those two saves were, were pivotal to us getting anything from the game. Yeah, that's right before half time. And if that goes in, um, it's a whole different team talk at half time. And, you know, you're then coming out in the second half, really panicking that, you know, where this game could go. So a crucial time. And we spoke about it. He's made crucial saves nearly every single game since the turn of the year. Uh, so the more the more and more with each passing week, I'm thinking, you know what, he is he is a good, strong candidate for player of the year between him and him and Matt O'Reilly for me. Um, and again, he was some of the, some, the one of my gripes. So sometimes we heart. Not just heart, because obviously it's a collective thing, but see when we're under the cosh, even in the second half sometimes or whatever, I don't like this really short pass that we play out from goal kicks right to Liam Scales. And it's again, it just sometimes invites pressure. Um, you know, But if you remember what Hart, I think it was the, the Ibrox game earlier in the season where he, he was kind of making a few mistakes and inviting pressure on, but he's, he's definitely grown arms and legs. I think he's got better as the season's gone on. He's making crucial saves. And it'll just be fitting if we can get him a, a title win to to end his career on. Um, I think he deserves it. And and as you've said, it's not just his performances, it's his, his leadership skills, everything that goes with it. So, yeah, another big performance from him. Don't think he was at fault for, obviously, either of their goals. Um, and, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to seeing more of him kind of making those saves. Hopefully, less. won't need to make as many saves in the coming weeks. But when he's been called upon, he's he's been uh, someone reliable and, and steady. He's been massive. He's been absolutely massive. Obviously, Southgate wasn't keeping an eye on him because he's had his international career, but what a career he's had. Um, I mentioned the false equivalence of Awata being filled in the lead-up to the, the Rangers goal that was chopped off. And, you know, it's frustrating at times because all you hear is, all right, OK, well, if, if Johnston's uh, wasn't a foul, then neither was Awata's. It doesn't work like that. You know, when you look at that particular situation with Awata, um, and it's a completely different foul. Uh, there, there is no, there's no issue around diving, um, and that isn't just me watching with a, a balanced viewpoint. Stilva was booked for diving, so there was a dive involved, according to the referee, in the initial movement. Uh, whereas Awata was taken out, um, and then obviously the, the 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 play was brought back. Now, thankfully, um, our very own Alan Morrison shared the following for decisions incidents relating to goals. Penalty, no penalty, and red cards for denying an obvious goal-scoring opportunity. It may be necessary to review the attacking phase of play, which led directly to the decision incident. This may include um, how the attacking team gained possession of the ball in open play. Because I've seen a debate last night raging on saying that it wasn't the same phase of play because Celtic players touched the ball twice between a water being filled and the goal being scored. And if you look at the IFAB, which everybody now uses as their source, which is quite right, it basically shows, no, 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 no. Actually, when did Rangers win possession? Let's go back to that. That's the phase of play and that's where it starts. Yeah, I was, to be honest, I'm shocked that he didn't see it in real time. It was right in front of him. It was quite a clear one. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I thought it was a blatant decision. And as you said, the nothing like their incident, completely different. You know, like we've discussed already, Johnson won the ball. Um, uh, so I was just shocked that you didn't see it in real time, but I was quite confident that if they look back and that, surely that will that will get disallowed because it was it was pretty pretty obvious. Um, but yeah, look, uh, refereeing decisions aside, just to kind of as we kind of, I'm I'm genuinely I think the more you kind of reflect on it, that's a good point for us yesterday. Um, you know, we've we've talked about obviously the frailties in that second half performance, which you know you'd like to see us kind of get better at when we come under pressure, how we can wrestle a game back in our favour. I think that's something I've, I've yet to see us do much this season where where we've come under pressure, we don't seem to be able to 
rectify it. But overall, I think you, you ask any of their fans before the start of the game, they really thought they were going to win. A draw wouldn't have been a good result for them. So why they're... Obviously, given how the game went, I can see why a draw for them at the end, they're, you know, they'll, they'll take that. But for them to go around celebrating and call it a moral victory, I think that'll come back to bite them. You know, um, I was looking at the fixtures coming ahead. We've got five at home and two two away. No, a minute. Sorry, let me double check that. Four, four, and, got two. Six, four and two. Four and yeah. two. Four and two. And they've got five away and two at home. You know, and, and we've got the home fixture against them. And I think that's why Rodgers has been so calm, even in the aftermath of yesterday. I think he fancies us that if, we, if it comes to it, and we need to just beat them at home with a full Celtic park. I think I don't think they'll handle it. I don't think they'll handle it. I'm pretty confident that we'll, we'll take them. It's better we can do the job in the other games. Um, but look, they've got two difficult away games coming up as well. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if, if there's drop points from them before before it even gets to the split. But, uh, you know, all in all, for us yesterday, I think that's the better result for us. I don't know how you kind of see the title race now, but I think it tips into our favour. No, I'm I'm the same, and I know that there are Celtic fans who say, "I but we shouldn't be in this situation." We are, we absolutely yeah. are. So now you just need to draw a line and say, "Right, this is where we are. This is what we need to do." I don't think this season will be a classic, and regardless of what happens, it's never going to be regarded as a classic. I think we've had trouble all the way through it. You know, spanning back to recruitment to to Ben and Rogers' return, a lot of people didn't want that, and then we've had you know really really poor injury, uh, a poor injury run. So yeah, at the end of the season, I'll tell you what, it will be a sweet one if we do win it. And oh, yeah. I am, oh, yeah. I'm still very, very, you know, confident that we can. We've got it within our hands. This is the thing, right? And it goes back to what Brendan said. We're writing the story here. If we mess up, no one else to blame. Absolutely yeah. no one else to blame. So yes, we will be here every single kick of the ball, every step of the way. It's always an absolute pleasure for anyone um, who's wondering where Jerry is. Jerry is in an area where he probably wouldn't get a great signal. So we just thought, you know what, chill out, Jerry. Just chill out after the game for a day. Enjoy it. Hopefully you can get a signal to watch it, though, my friend. And we will invite you back on as normal next week. Thank you, everybody, for getting involved. If you want a wee wander around paradise tonight with myself and Tino from the Celtic Exchange, that will be on the channel at 6 o'clock. Come back and watch it then. Final 50 tickets for the Martin O'Neill gig at Barra's Art and Design have been released. They're flying, so if you want to come along uh, for what is, in my view, the best Celtic speakers night that I've ever experienced, then the ticket link is underneath this. I may be biased, but I just think, you know, he's up there with, with Strachan and all that. He's brilliant. And we've got big video, on-screen video um, displays and all that kind of stuff as well um, to add to the event. So if you want to come along, ticket link underneath this video. Thank you to the 2,000 uh, strong who tuned in live. That's sensational figures. Thank you every single one of you, for getting involved in a Celtic state of mind. And thank you once again, Asim Rabani, for joining me on the Axon Bulletin.